Hi, we're the Sheffield PhD students in the Energy Storage CDT. Hi, I'm Connor Smith. Uh, hi, I'm Ian Brocklebow. I'm James Moore. I'm Richard Johnson. And I'm Carl Kinnick. We'd like to talk to you a little bit about one of the forms of energy storage that we've been studying in the lab. Supercapacitors. What is a supercapacitor? What's it for? And how does it work? These are examples of supercapacitors made in our lab. Button cells. You'll note they look quite different to those that you might have bought in an electrical shop or in your electronics. That's because our small scale production methods differ and a university lab lacks the same equipment as a high end manufacturer. We also want to analyse our products rather than simply making them. These cells might look a little bit more familiar, but what exactly is the purpose of a supercapacitor? Supercapacitors, also known as ultracapacitors, are a fairly prevalent form of power storage that feature often in day to day life. They have very fast charge and discharge rates and can withstand over half a million cycles. They store energy in two ways. The first being via electrostatic charge accumulation on the surface of the electrode. This is fundamentally governed by surface area, which is extremely high due to the microporous carbon electrodes and is known as electric double layer capacitance. Alternatively, they can store energy via electrochemical fluidic reversible reactions that occur on the electrode surface, which is known as pseudocapacitance. These two mechanisms can operate individually or simultaneously depending on the material of the electrode. Supercapacitors that can perform both mechanisms are known as hybrid capacitors. Before any other stages in the production process can begin, the mixture of components that make up the electrode material must first be weighed, combined and mixed into a uniform slurry. The three major components of a supercapacitor electrode are active carbon, which provides the surface area for double layer formation, carbon black, which improves the electronic conductivity of the electrode material, and binder, which aids adhesion between the electrode material and the current collector. After these components have been weighed and combined, a solvent is added and the resulting solution undergoes heating and stirring until particles are evenly distributed and a desirable viscosity level is attained. After mixing, we draw the slurry onto an aluminium foil substrate using a doctor blade. This is generally set between 100 and 200 micrometers and the process results in an electrode film of uniform thickness. Different metal substrates are available and different metals result in different energy and power densities. We then dry the drawdown in a vacuum oven and slice the sheets into smaller pieces so they are easier to punch. After this, 16mm diameter disc shaped electrodes are cut from the sheets using an electrode punch. This size is chosen as it fits easily inside the CR2032 coin cell cases that are available to us. After the production of all the various components, it's now time to assemble them together. To do this, it's important to use an argon filled glove box to protect the electrolyte and other components from moisture contamination. Firstly, we place a steel spacer in one half of the coin cell casing to help protect the electrode and aid compression of the components. One of the electrodes is then placed with the current collecting side onto the steel spacer before adding a fibre glass separator, which is then soaked with electrolyte. This electrolyte soaked separator is an important part of the construction, aiding ion transport whilst also ensuring there is no direct contact between the electrodes. The active material side of the second electrode is then placed facing the separator before adding another steel spacer and finally the other half of the coin cell casing. This assembly is then crimped, bringing all the components into close contact and sealing the coin cell protecting the contents from contamination. And there we have it, a finished supercapacitor coin cell. Once the supercapacitors have been manufactured in the glove box and they need to be tested in order to analyse their performance, we use two machines and pieces of software to do this. The first machine from Arvin Industries is used to run galvanostatic and cyclic voltammetry cycles. When the machine is run galvanostatically, it runs cycles of constant current at a variety of C rates. This allows us to produce plots of I versus dV by dt and V versus I. From this, and using the equations shown here, we can determine capacitance um, ESR. The cyclic voltammetry sets a constant increase in voltage and constantly changes the current to achieve this. It produces plots of I versus V that can be used to show if behaviour is via EDLC or pseudocapacitance. The second machine from Solitron uses electrochemical impedance spectroscopy. This applies a sinusoidal change in voltage and analyses the current output. 
This determines the magnitude of the real and imaginary parts of the impedance to give the contributions of different types of the cell impedance to the total. As you have seen, working in a lab to produce supercapacitors can be quite involved, but it's also the best way to experiment and tweak the designs in order to get the best possible supercapacitors. With their continuing improvement, supercapacitors have the potential to electrify many industries, finding a place in the regenerative braking systems in vehicles to large-scale grid storage, and this is of a great importance to both energy storage as a class of technologies and the industries that can use it to their advantage.